Hello, That's ladies and gentlemen. Stuff. It's August 7th at 1 o'clock Eastern Time, and this is Higher Ed Live. Um, this is the admissions live part of Higher Ed Live. I'm your host today, Joe Salustio, Chief Operating Officer at Claremont Lincoln University. And today we're discussing non traditional um, perspectives on the value of higher education. Admissions Live is part of the Higher Ed Live Network. All of these episodes offer you direct access to the best and brightest minds in education. And you can also be part of these live broadcasts by sharing your knowledge. Participate in today's discussion by tweeting us at hashtag higher ed live. Today's live broadcast is powered by Platform Q, education's conduit online engagement platform. Learn how to integrate continuous online engagement into your marketing and enrollment plans using conduit. Visit platformqedu.com. All of our episodes are recorded. They're free and easy to access in the video archives at higheredlive.com or take Higher Ed Live with you on the go by subscribing to the podcast. Higher Ed Live is produced by M. Stoner, a digital first agency committed to tailored solutions that drive real results. So I'd like to first welcome my guests today, Chris Onan, Lynn Pretty, and Josh Dorsey. Welcome, everybody. Hello. Hello, hello. Uh, um, so just to, for the audience uh, and for those that download this uh, podcast later, I do want to just do a quick introduction of the guest today so that you have an understanding of where everybody is coming from. Uh, Chris Onan, I'll start with you. Uh, Chris has invested in over 250 early growth stage businesses. He currently sits on the board of directors of Food Maven, Vinyl Me Please, and Software Colorado. He is a co-founder and former COO slash CFO at Galvanize current board member and the former president and chairman of the Rocky Mountain Venture Capital Association and a co-founder of the Associates Board of Big Brothers and Big Sisters of Colorado. Josh Dorsey is managing director at Silicon Valley Bank. For the past four years, Josh led Silicon Valley Bank's hardware and frontier tech team in Northern California, working with entrepreneurs in the transportation, robotics, aerospace, virtual reality, augmented reality, consumer electronics, and semiconductor industries. He also brings experience from various roles at SVB, including the private equity services team. And Dr. Lynn Pretty is currently the provost and chief academic officer at National American University, where I believe she's held that role for the past five years. Previous to that role, she was vice president for accreditation services at the Higher Learning Commission for 14 years. There, she also served in the roles of director of education and training and peer review, as well as the assistant director of the peer corps and support processes. Lynn is an authority on educational models and delivery. You know, I'm really honored that you all uh, were able to join me today uh, for this discussion. We're gonna talk about non-traditional uh, perspectives on education. Um, it's, you know, I try to bring together guests that come from different areas. Lynn is an insider, if you will. Uh, I sort of an in insider work in higher ed and Josh and Chris being in the venture capitalist world. Um, Chris has some experience uh, with, with higher ed as well and looking at how people perceive what's happening in higher ed today. And, and, and you know, uh, for the audience, again, you can hashtag higher ed live if you have any live questions for us. I'll do my uh, best to, uh, to ask those questions as they come in, uh, but I'll start with a few of my own. And Lynn, I wanna start with you, right? So you've been yeah. doing this a long time, you know? Um, uh, and, you know, what is going on in higher ed today? I mean, what the heck is going on? Cause it's, you know, every time we read the news, something else is happening. Give us your overview of, of higher ed today. Okay, so I'm giving the overview, but everybody has to realize I broke out of that regulatory environment, which I had believed at one point would be able to help move higher education into the innovative arena. But I'm ahead of myself. So where are we? We are on the edge of so many possibilities. It's incredible what might be created, and that's what I hope we get in to talk about. However, we're also on a precipice. So I want to make about four points kind of open us up and kick off some debates, questions, um, perhaps um, trigger some, some anger on the part of the audience and, and get them uh, tweeting in. But this precipice, a lot of institutions are falling off of it. And folks, uh, the business model is unsustainable. The landscape is overbuilt. This is point number one. Uh, there's no venture capital attitude at all in higher ed. Uh, we're struggling to grasp ed tech to its maximum, um, and we're just terribly overbuilt. So those closures you're hearing about, they will happen. They'll happen again and again, and the saddest part is they'll happen to the people, the citizens that can least stand them to close, okay? 
overbuilt. I'll come back to that though, because that may not be the actual problem. And it may not even be a problem. So that's something to think about. We have myriad institutions in the United States. So I wanna talk and make sure everyone understands no single thing applies to N any and all institutions. You've got solid research use that are probably doing some of the most innovative ed tech venture capitalist stuff out there. It's just that that's not norm higher ed as people are talking about it. And that's point number two. The narrative about quote, this big thing called higher ed has gone negative on everyone, despite the diversity, despite the boutique, despite the mission, despite the commitment. Bottom line, cost and debt have gotten it a bad rap. It's terrible. You can't, you, you know, the cost of what it takes to go to college. Um, you have your closings, you have the scandal of the admissions piece. You've got higher ed that is um, lacking innovation. It's basically the 1906 model. Look, we're still studying the same disciplines. Case Western Reserve, several institutions have tried to integrate, but bottom line, we're still following a model of what education means and people becoming, quote, educated. Add to that a regulatory environment now that we have financial aid funds. That means that everybody has their fingers, states, accreditors, um, the Department of Ed, everyone has their fingers in to who can do what. And so you've got a narrative that basically comes back to this. I just don't know that higher ed is worth the cost and worth the value. It doesn't seem as valuable anymore. That's number one. Number two, you know, it's old. They're still studying old stuff. It doesn't seem really relevant. I go there and it's like they don't even use the newest technology. I can't even get to the class on my phone. Next. Well, that's something you do when you're out of hire. I need something right now. I need to learn right now. I don't have time to even be online and answer and post discussions to people that I don't even know. What is this thing that I'm trying to do in this um online environment that's so foreign to how I interact with Amazon or interact with my bank or interact with a counselor or even interact with, with healthcare these days. So there's this eroding of perceived value, but two other things. Higher ed is no longer the knowledge authority. People are going elsewhere for their knowledge. Point three, the people and the politics, right? So Everyone has a cell phone, everyone has Twitter, everyone has Instagram. We have all this technology. We're able to do everything quickly, easily, instantaneously, and constantly. Last time you tried to enroll in a class, how long did it take? How instant was it? How easy was it? Um, how many people did you have to talk to? I don't know the last time I had to talk to a person to transfer funds or even open up an, a, a new IRA, okay? I can do everything on my phone while I'm hiking, or maybe now on my watch. I don't even need to carry a wallet or an ID any longer. Higher ed, the people are forcing a change. And that's easy to say and higher ed's catching up, but the real change in my mind is this constancy. Okay, so we've gone from kind of an iterative, you go to college for four years, then you get out and go to the real world. No, no, people are living in the real world. Twitter is constant, email is constant, online is constant, Facebook is constant, everything is happening now, 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 and learning should be the same way. Just on top of that, you don't read instructions to learn any longer. Okay, so think of how you learn a software or even a game. How many of you read the instructions first before just jumping in? So the learner's really driving the change and that ups the ante on the politics. So when someone says they should have free access to college education, why? Just leave that out there. At the same time, last point, the need for learning is ever increasing and the demand for it is higher on everyone's part and everyone is aware they need more learning faster, at a faster pace and in a different way. Right? and a different type of learning, and many, many types of learning, all right now. So what has actually happened in higher education is we've unbundled the idea that we need to learn from the idea that the where we go do it is in a college. Okay? I'm going to say that again because that could really rat, um, rub some people wrong. We Just think of it this way. Try this experiment. Think about if you needed to learn something brand new, to start something brand new, where would you go get that new learning? Does it instantly pop in your mind that you go back to college for a four-year or a two-year or even a one-year degree or certificate? We no longer equate 
schools with learning. Education, yes, but it's learning we need right now, and we've got to come up with a different and new model for learning. That's my opening, Ed. Well, I'll tell you, if that's if <laughs> if, uh, if higher ed's got that list of issues, we, <laughs> we've got to do some really fast work to, to right the ship. And Chris, I, I want to ask you, you know, what, what do you think about all of what Lynn said and, and, you know, sort of framing this, you know, five, seven years ago, there was the narrative was you go get your bachelor's degree. The master's is now the new bachelor's. So there still was this talk of degree five years ago and immediately, almost instantaneously, it flipped. Um, and there were new models of education that really came in into higher ed uh, or to compete with higher ed overnight. And uh, you were sort of part of that that wave, and you know. So, can you respond to what Lynn said? Tell me what your view is on higher ed. Well, what I think Lynn said that really resonated with me is the the focus on return on investment, and you know, education. It, all education is good education. We can agree on that. I think the question is, what's the return on investment? And if you know, individuals who are eighteen to twenty two are spending eighty grand a year for four years. Quick math. That's three hundred twenty thousand dollars. And they're coming out, I don't know, I don't want to pick on psych majors, but I'll pick on psych majors. And they come out and they get a job as a barista at a coffee shop making 35 grand a year. You can't just charge that student loan debt in bankruptcy. That I'm just not sure that's an outcome that is a good one for that individual student. And so the return on investment focus that Lynn mentioned is really why we found it galvanized, because there's just a, a clear supply-demand imbalance in software developers. There just weren't enough of that. And so we were just focused on skills and hey, it's a six month program. There's no degree, there's no certification. You come out with skills. And one of the things that wasn't obvious six, seven years ago when we started Galvanize, but now very clearly is, is employers are saying, eh, bachelor's degree, college, you know, it's nice if you have it, but it is not that threshold filter. You have to do this in order to apply. Companies like Google are saying, hey, we'll look at your GitHub account and if you can write code, uh, we're going to hire you. And so I, I really think the narrative has switched to a skills-based world. And the other thing that Lynn hit on, which is so accurate, is you know when I went to college 25 years ago, uh, in order to read Freud or read uh, you know corporate finance theory, you kind of had to go to college. Well, now you can get a Kindle or on an Audible account, and you can kind of self-learn. Now, sure, you don't get the community aspect, and you don't get that Socratic method of learning. But I, I do think... You know, education is going to continue to evolve. And and the other thing Lynn hit on is there are people in kind of higher ed that get it, and there are people that don't. And there are people who, who in higher ed who think their buildings and their real estate protects them. Uh, in the venture world, we would look at that and say, wow, that's a really levered business model. And if your revenue dips 5%, 10%, you're in real trouble. Um, and there are people like Steve Kaplan, the president of the University of New Haven, his provost, Dan May, who we worked with at Galvanize to create a fully accredited master's degree in data science. And they, they totally got it. And they said, look, we have a, a, a program running in the Middle East right now. We want to have a program running at Galvanize San Francisco. Our students want to learn all over the place on their terms. And I think there are people in higher ed that get it and are going to adapt, and their universities are going to do just fine. In fact, they're probably going to thrive. Josh, what about you? I mean, you talk to, you're in the VC sort of world all day, all the time. Your, your, you know, investors are coming. They're looking at different industries to start businesses in or, or back. You know, what do you see in terms of higher ed? Do you see um, an interest in higher ed in general? Do you see, um, you know, how does that translate in your world of big business? Well, I think... If you're looking at how venture capitalists would, would look at this, there's several trends in which should get them excited about wanting to invest in the space. So you have this idea of moving from like analog to digital. So most of everything is moving online and that's a big, big trend for them. You have a changing workforce where they're talking about the world becoming automated and we're not training our you know current class of coming in or the current working force how to deal with that new kind of digitalization of the world, um, if this general, general, generalizational switch uh, where generations are now okay with mobile, okay with not necessarily your traditional classroom setting, they're used to absorbing content and participating with kind of mobile devices. Um, to what, to what, what, what both uh, Lynn and uh, Chris said, you have the unit economics, which 
you know, are just total backwards, which should give you, you know, lots of opportunities as venture capitalists to go ahead and um, take advantage of those. You now actually have the technology infrastructure to help that with kind of like cloud computing. You have some of this machine learning stuff where you can help with uh, having more of a one to many strategy or a bigger presence that's not always just analog. Um, and then there's just kind of the macro trends of, of, of what's going on across the other world and where people are spending their money, you know, particularly in things like Asia, where they spend a ton of money on kind of supplemented education and helping them do that. So like all those trends from a pure VC standpoint makes a ton of sense for, you know, venture capital to come into this space and do it. The problem is we haven't really seen that. So if you go back and kind of look at the investment trends over the last you know, several years, there really hasn't been a large exit uh, within the space to just to say VCs, this is a VC model in which we want to do it. And a lot of it comes to, you know, the who owns the customer and and how are we going to monetize that business model? There's still a ton of friction. Are we selling to universities which have lumpy sales cycles? Is that the right way to do it? Are you selling to consumers? And then at what level? Is it largely for kids? How do you think about that? So it's it's been a very, I think, tough understanding. But I think a lot of these things are like that. It's more of this evolutionary process where you have, you know, I think look at things like you know, financial services and um, you look at uh, education is one of them. You look at healthcare. These things are longer cycles because they're so ingrained in what we're doing. So I think the models there, like, People just haven't figured out how to really monetize the model. So from a pure venture standpoint, I think all the trends and everything points to we should we should look into this space and we should actually deploy capital here. But we haven't seen the outcomes yet to where we've seen this high amount of flooding of venture dollars into kind of educational tech, as you would call it, in the VC landscape. Yeah, that's interesting because, you know, there's a – and Lynn, I'm going to ask you just – there's – overall declining enrollment in general in, in colleges and universities, right? There's just less, there are less high school students deciding to go to college. They are looking at alternative methods. Apprenticeships uh, are becoming more popular. Uh, uh, they sort of were very popular, went away for a number of years and are sort of coming back. Um, you know, if you're a pharmacist, you're interested in becoming a, a working at a pharmacy, you can go and, and shadow a pharmacist at, at Walgreens. You don't necessarily have to go back uh, to college for that or even a career school in some sense, you know, so there's been that sort of shifting landscape. There's, there's less students coming into college, but there's more competition. Um, what is that? So how, if you're, I, I saw actually one of the, the state university systems just is starting to go online to cater to their in-state students. And I, and I go, wow, that's, are, are we behind Is higher ed just failing to move fast? And, and there's always this, this moment where you say higher ed slow and, and you get slapped on the wrist by, by by people that don't think so that work within higher ed, but you look outside higher ed and everybody looks inside higher ed and thinks it runs a little slowly. So what is competition doing to, to our marketplace in general? Wow, that's a that is a, a gigantic question because my brain jumps in, in multiple different directions. And it again comes back to this idea that I was trying to say is that people have decoupled learning and education. Learning is something that is constant and people are pursuing learning. And I believe that they're pursuing learning anywhere, anytime they can get it, when they need it, if they know what's needed. And right. so so that's one place my brain goes. And, and, and so to me, competitors, venture capitalists, I, I welcome all this because I, I think the more fundamental change is that whole orientation to learning and the way learning is done. Chris mentions to you in the chat line. And you know, that just, blows my mind. We just completed a turnaround of an institution, sold it off to an equity group. It was worth maybe 50 million initially, sold it for over 470 million in a matter of three years. Now what's going to happen to it? Not really sure. Equity groups are entering the market. Um, and, and so then, you know, you could say it's going to be overbuilt, but then look at all of the corners on which we have a Starbucks, an urgent care, a Walgreens, a CVS. Maybe we're thinking about this the wrong way. Um, you know, everyone's going away from ground education, and yet, and, and, and yet there are retail models and health models and service models that still fit ground-based. So, so 
you know, I don't know that I can even begin to box the competition. What I can't, so to me, the competition is the right thing to happen. The more disruptive we can get, the better, we, the closer we'll get to really serving learning. Then the big questions come. So how do we codify that learning? How do we know someone has it? Who demonstrates it? Who's left behind? Does everyone get it? Um, how do, do they all know how to access it? Can they tell true from fake? Um, and the big question for me um, is, what about that higher education that was meant to be slow, deep, life-changing, rattling your own thoughts about yourself, defining the new you? That doesn't necessarily, is that going to happen in bits now? Or does that still take that kind of deep dialogue? The research universities, um, the way they're connected differently. How, does, how would venture capital go there? My brain goes to those questions. So I actually, there's lots of competition coming in, but I still think Simon Sinek, I think everybody knows that person, would say uh, higher education and even learning are, are, are really struggling with the what and the how right now, and higher education has even lost its why. I mean, why? What? Why? Why do we have higher education right now if we have this new competition, this new learning? I'm struggling with that. I think we have big questions right now. So I'm looking forward to competition. Josh, Chris? I was just going to say, when I was at Northwestern in the mid-90s, it had a reputation as a pre-professional school. Yeah. And, that, and that was something Northwestern really chafed at, right? That was bad. Yeah. And, and I, I feel like that narrative is changing. I, I just don't think there's anything wrong with higher education providing a pathway to a career. Right? Where I live in Denver, we live in a pretty nice neighborhood right by Denver University. The guy who lives across the street from me is an electrician, never went to college. And his house is three times the size of ours. And so it seems to me that you know vocational training and having a vocation is working just fine. And I, and I think there's been a little bit of a stigma around that for the past 20 to 30 years. And, and I, I feel like the tide is turning. Like, it's totally appropriate to go be a truck mechanic. My mom's on the board of uh, this trucking company in Minneapolis. And if they post a resume for an office manager, they get 500 resumes from college grads. If they post uh, a position for a truck mechanic making 100 grand a year, full benefits, they don't get any resumes. Yeah. Mm. You yeah know, that's, go, go, go ahead, Lynn. Uh, so it's back to that whole supply demand piece again, and I think that that's where higher ed's really kind of missing missing the boat. This this um, <laughs> I'm only saying this in response, Chris, to your point on on mechanics because I live in a small city right now, and they are posting hundred and fifty thousand dollar jobs for diesel mechanics, and they can't get anybody. They can't. I mean, it's stunning to me how we have not figured out. Um, working vocation and other patterns, and then societal patterns. The rural urban is going to be a fascinating mix in the future. No, no. What, one of the things that and, and that I see, and, and I don't know if you guys see it, <clears throat> the the sort of caste system of, of higher ed is very similar to, to to people, right? So we have elite institutions. They have multi billion dollar endowments. You know, and the NCAA is not going anywhere. College football is not going anywhere. There's a there's a revenue model around universities in, in that space, and a lot of them are research universities, and so they're always going to be funded in some capacity. You have um, a group of institutions that are new and flexible, um, trying to service a student consumer that is, is doing everything they can to stay out of debt, and there's this shrinking middle uh, of institutions that are small, call them thousand. Yeah, really 500 to let's say 5,000 students that are really shrinking because there's competition from both ends sort of squeezing them out. You know, the 18 year old that is thinking about going to, you know, Stanford and here in, in, in California is still going to go to Stanford. But there are a number of adult students that are just not going to be attending universities unless they cater to that student consumer in terms of, of access and debt. And Josh, I'll ask you because you're an ROI guy. I know that. And, and so we go back to that, the ROI of universities in general, and how do we think, you know, as, as parents now um, on sending kids to school? I mean, what does that even look like? How do you even plan for something like that in a, 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 a industry that is shifting by the day almost? 
Yeah, I, I, I stopped asking my kids what they want to be when they grow up because the job that they want probably doesn't exist right now. And so, like, I've stopped asking that question. But I think, if, I think what's happening is a little bit to what you're saying around squeezing the middle is this this idea of kind of the it's going to be the evolution of higher education, and it's you're either going to evolve or die. And I think the right question to think about, and I think it's what Chris was talking about earlier, was what does the future job look like? And then how are you then using higher education to allow those folks to get into, you know, those jobs? So I think the question, you know, the questions that are, you know, the, the higher universities, I think, still have the, you know, the prestige and pedigree and the data still says that if you have a higher education, Education, you you know make more money, uh, or you have a you know, better opportunity to make more money, and those people make more money faster than someone who doesn't have it. So that that would still tell you to go do it, but it's more of like, what is it that that those things are going to do for you, and how are those going to evolve? I think a lot of those middle ones, they're either going to have to evolve to what the job is going to be for these people when they get out, and this could be entrepreneurship, creativity, more emotional intelligence type of learning, like a, a settled base, and then it's going to be this skills based and empowering kind of employees thereafter and how do you use your employees as kind of your ROI and you're seeing companies get funded. We have a really nice one here called Guild of Education in Denver, which is allowing you to like train your current workforce to make them more powerful for you. So you're actually getting even a bigger return on your folks as you're re-educating them. So it's this, it's almost this credentialing system as, as you move up. There's another really well-funded uh, startup in Silicon Valley called Degreed, which is doing really well. And what they're doing is they're taking a lifelong learning approach. You're saying, okay, I'm going to have you know this degree from my university, and then I'm bolting on this skill that's going to help me maybe in machine learning, and then I'm bolting on this skill for automation. And you have this credentialing and almost stacking of education to do that. So I think from like a competition, it's either you evolve or die because the workforce, and again, this is kind of an output when you go to college to then get a job and you're gonna put yourself in the best position to do that. I think those companies either evolve or they're not gonna be here. I think the other institutions are always, the Harvards, the Stanfords, if you will, will be always be around. It's those middle of them that are, if they don't evolve, I think they're going to die. Lynn, what's that middle look like in your eyes right now? Um, the majority. Actually, you know, if you think that 52% of the student population or more now is the non-traditional working person and everybody is working. No one just goes to college. Very few people just go to college and not work anymore. They, they do multiple things, right? So college is something you do along with the rest of your life, not stopping and going off to college. There's still a population that does that. So right now, if you think that the, that when, um, so a small institution in the United States by the accreditors is defined as an institution that has 1,000 students or fewer. Okay? A large institution is any institution with 4,000. That tells you the, inc the incredible number of small institutions and a good two, three, 400 will quickly close. So just, the finances aren't going to work. They, it's just there's just too many other alternatives and there probably should be. So you're beginning to see the same kind of arrangements in higher ed trying to form, but I don't, but I, but I think uh, both Chris and Josh are right. The market, the job, the workforce is driving the learning. And so the real learning um, innovation, I think is going to occur outside of higher ed or in conjunction with higher ed. I've often said people joke with me, they will say, Lynn, you, you sound like you're a provost in search of a, an industry that wants to buy you. And I keep thinking, yeah, I, I would absolutely love somebody walk up and say, hey, I own a multi-million dollar, multi-billion dollar business. I need a whole pipeline of employees. I'd like to remake you into the learning track for all of those positions. Would you be interested? And I take about half a second to say, absolutely, because I think that that's, that's going to be where we go. I think both Chris and Josh are right that middle institution still offering up the traditional education, counting on the high school graduate, 18 to 22 year old, moving there due to small team sports and to a get a, a, a rite of passage experience. I think that's dwindling extremely quickly. Your small Catholic institute, any any small faith-based institution is in trouble. Um, it's just, 
It just, it, particularly privates, it's just not a sustainable model. Vocational technical institutions, why would a student attend that if they know they could go to Galvanize or if they can go to any one of a number of businesses that are offering their own learning tracks that lead to the same job possibilities? It really comes down to the question of what's the worth of a credential that has credits behind it. And you really no, think that. Yeah, I just to interrupt you real fast. You know, one interesting thing that you brought up, as we saw a number of schools in the career college sector close that were offering that vocational training, community colleges are stepping up and they're offering a lot right. more skills-based training. They, they, that's right. their pipeline to survival uh, is to offer more technical training uh, in, at those colleges. But if the employer down the street suddenly offers it connected to a job, and in fact, you actually get the job and get a paycheck that allows you to go to that learning at a lower cost, maybe a cash-based cost, paid out of a pay deduction. I, I mean, I can think of five, six, seven different financial models that are much more feasible than even the community college model right now that actually, I mean, what I hear from our students is, can you give me a job first? And can then I train to get the profession I want to be in? It's just, there's a different, I think we have to think totally and completely differently. But I, but um, I have a question, I, just to play devil's advocate, can I ask the other two a question, Joe? Sure, I mean, that's what it's all about here. Let's ask the hard question. So, so, Bring it. So here's the thing. Is the idea of college for the betterment of society to produce good citizens, people who follow the golden rule, such as Claremont Lincoln University, have a core built around dialogue and um, and social justice and development of civic responsibility. Is that gone? Do you see that moving? Do we see that in need, i.e. a non-work focused higher education? Where has that gone or is it even needed anymore? I'd love to know your perspectives. That's definitely the, that's definitely the rub, right? Clearly yeah. people can come to galvanize or they can go to other places to get the skills. But I had four years to become an adult in a walled garden and be well-rounded, and it's a community that wants to make the world better. And and you know, let's be honest, that that isn't the focus of a short skills-based training program. Right. And so I think that's probably the really enduring value prop of traditional higher ed is that focus. I think Josh hit on something interesting, and and you talked about it also. The change from the discrete four-year education to the continuous learning over 20 to 30 years and a change in who's paying for it, yeah. right? Amongst corporates, it is an absolute talent war. Capital is clearly a commodity. Google doesn't have any trouble finding cash. Apple doesn't have any trouble finding cash. I think they have more cash than like 98% of all countries. So their only limiter to growing is talent. And so if they are the beneficiary of the talent and the skills, they should be paying along the way. And look, yeah. if, if Apple loses an engineer, I think it costs them like three or 400 grand in finding someone new, paying the recruiter, training up the new individual. And so why not take that three to $400,000 over five to seven years and invest it into that individual in a data science course, in a humanities course, we wanna preserve well-roundedness or a sustainability course. And I think it's that shift to continuous education. And and look, I'm not a I'm not one of those people that would say, hey, it's it's skills based training and traditional academia is dead. I think there's absolutely a role for thought leaders in traditional academia to support that. Right, Mitch Daniels, I think, is uh, chancellor yeah. or president at Purdue, and is doing some really interesting stuff. I think they bought Kaplan. I've never heard of a nonprofit buying a company before, Josh. I don't know if you have, mm -hmm. but I mean, doing some really interesting things, and I think. They were one of the first ones to adopt income share agreements, which I think are absolutely brilliant for people who are watching. That's where the student doesn't you know, pay up front. They, 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 the, they get a loan, basically pay it off as they have a job, and, and the, the lender takes a portion of their income. I'll, I'll pimp University Ventures just a little bit. That was our earliest and most important backer at Galvanize. They're a venture firm that only focuses on education, and they backed a company called Reviture that found people that wanted to become software developers and paid them to come and take the courses and then build them out to uh, Reviture clients to do software development work. So, so the students paid nothing and got paid while they learned 
And that's been a wildly successful uh, investment for the University Ventures team. And I just think that model is absolutely captivating. Yeah. Yeah, yeah the, Lam the Lambda School is doing the same thing where there, it, there's no cost to it other than they get a portion of what your salary is on the other side and then they guarantee that uh, um, once you get it because they're giving you the skill set of the learning to get those high quality jobs to your point that are feeding the talent gap that's already you know just already massive in, in kind of tech so yeah those business models I think are really interesting and really disruptive to the traditional higher education model Lynn, I, I'll weigh in. Yeah, obviously, uh, you know, uh, Claremont Lincoln, where, where I work, um, we offer graduate degrees, and they are in, in areas uh, where the student can make a difference. And, and that is one thing we're, we're seeing as we talk to prospective students is they're coming with some idea of what they want to do. And, and what they're asking for is an education that allows them to do it. It's an action research-based education, something that allows them to create some type of change. And so the student has evolved from somebody who receives education to someone who is more aware of what is going on around them and they want to do something about it and they come for, for the skills to affect that change. And so there's been a shift, I think, uh, when you get into the sort of the, the higher echelon of education and, you know, you, you get that bachelor's and that master's and you may, may people even go for their doctorate. They want a meaning behind it. They don't just do it to do it. There's some meaning. It's it's a, a meaning to go up in their career, to advance, uh, some meaning to start a business. I and mean, there's always something behind it. I don't think it just happens um, anymore just by chance where they have to go get a master's degree and you just do it. So that would be my response in, t in talking to students is they're always wanting some greater meaning uh, in increasing numbers, uh, if that makes sense. No, it does. See, that's that was my point too. They're actively seeking learning that they know they need and they want because they want to do something. Put that up against higher education institutions. We're constantly sitting in the back room saying, okay, what program should we offer? What program should we deliver? How could we design this education, this learning, so that they come and take it? That that's also a piece that actually has to totally flip. Because I think that that's, I think we're all hitting on this idea that employers need something different. Even if it's for the total betterment of society, people are seeking it. Higher ed is not dispensing it. There's something there. I can't quite figure it out yet. I, and, and it goes back to the, so where is the why of higher education? Why, does it, why is it still in the mix? What's its why? Is it now to be forums where brilliant talent, AKA faculty, help people who really learn at the level and the pace level necessary to fill those jobs? It's, it's just a real question as to if the whole thing has flipped to it's not higher education determining what needs to be learned and what means for you to be educated, but society and the workplace and the citizens themselves saying, here's what I need to know. That's a, that's a radical, radical change in authority. Yeah. That's, I'd love that. That's, I think that's as disruptive as some of the technologies and some of the funding bases. I think that's a real struggle right now. Ask any faculty member whether they feel like they're in control of their discipline, right? What's a discipline anymore? I was English, right? Composition and cognition. You should just come and take my course because it's a really important course. Composition and cognition. You know, I teach it. You have to take it. So you be here Monday, Wednesday, Friday, right? I, I mean, none of that makes sense anymore. That's my gig composition and cognition. What does it mean to anybody else, right? That's 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 what we're dealing with. Well, and that, that's interesting that you bring that up because obviously one thing we haven't really talked about is online education, right? right. There's, there's There are universities that have come uh, into the space that offer online education. Um, universities now that haven't offered online education are beginning to offer online education. There are, are very traditional universities that are outsourcing uh, and connecting with companies such as edX to be able to offer degrees online without, you know, there's this there's this uh, a, a balancing of physical resources and trying to slim down uh, your cost to offer an on online education. So there's that piece. But what is it? What does it look like? I and mean, you know, can we imagine what you know somebody who's who's born today when they go to college when they're looking at colleges when they're 18 years old are they going away to college? I mean, well, does going away to college even exist in 10 years? And Josh, I'll, I'll start with you and, and get your thoughts on this because you're a futurist. 
you know, do, do, do people go away to college or do they take college from their living room? You know, they, they go to college in their living room and, and kids just don't go away anymore. So you're going to be stuck with your kids for uh, life. In your basement. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I, I, um, I don't know. The, the, the only thing I get back to, and I was just thinking about your question, Lynn, on the why, and I think the, the why and, and around disciplines that, the, 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 the space in which education, and I don't know what this looks like, but I think if you, um, you know, I think it maybe becomes maybe less about the institution and actually maybe more about the discipline and the individual teaching the discipline. Because if you think about how people are consuming stuff today, so like people love to consume things on Netflix. We've seen a lot of that, a lot of that, um, you know, Snapchat and Facebook and Instagram, it's consuming information. What, what, what's lacking in education is how you take a consuming information and create a syllabus to do something after you've consumed it. And that's what education's really good at. So uh, there seems to me that there has to be this, uh, this, this point to it, or maybe the future is, maybe it's less about the institutions, and I'm just throwing this out there, but maybe it's less about the institutions and it's more that and this is what the internet does for everything. It's like, look at e-commerce, you, you know, instead of, you know, one, like 10 individual shoppers, you have thousands of shoppers because you have an internet and not a store on the ground. But then you, this professor could go out. That's really, you know, the smartest professor in that certain discipline and can create a curriculum and a content and have a more one to many strategy in which she'll to change it. And then I can then say that, you know, my credentials are actually worth something because I took it from that professor that actually does have the expertise in that space. And I mean, those are the trends that people are seeing where they, they don't mind taking content online. They just don't have a structured way of how to do it, anything with it afterwards, which I think is the big gap. And I think education plays that role. And maybe that eliminates kind of the, the hierarchy of the brand of the university and focuses more on the discipline and the individual that that has that expertise, and then maybe it goes to your point when we were talking about earth, earlier, where research universities become even more important. That's interesting. You know, that's where my mind's going. Is that it'll all go horizontal, worldwide, based on topical or discipline or whatever the driver area is, and then suddenly the faculty or whoever knows it best rises to the top as master trainers, and and there's a whole different orientation. It's an interesting thing to think about. Faculty, look at any website in higher ed. Faculty are not the first people you see. Right? It's just it's some interesting things to think about. Chris, you've been really quiet. <laughs> well, it's not my normal uh, state to be quiet, but I, I don't have any significant disagreements with what the two of you are saying yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. Um, you know, what about... Um, Lynn, you, you talked just a little bit about closing schools, and, and that's a, a topic I've, I've done a podcast on before, but I, wa I want to just bring it back up because it does affect, you know, uh, my question to you, um, and Chris, I'll ask you first. Um, as you started Galvanize, you were, you were I'm a guessing here, the, the, the student that was targeted or the student that you attracted was a mid-career switcher. That somebody that had some level of education, maybe was working in a in a career already that was offering them some level of benefit, but it wasn't um, potentially giving them all they wanted, and so they decided to go into something different. Is that accurate uh, in terms of the student that you guys were looking at at Galvanize? Yeah, you're giving us probably too much credit in the very early days. We we didn't know, yeah. Uh, but as it turned out, we had you know unemployed people apply, and then we had a lot of unhappily employed people. And some of them were doing quite well and making good money and consulting, but they just traveled five days a week and it was a miserable life. And, and they wanted to learn software development so that they could take control of their life, right? If you're a software developer, you can work remotely, you can work from home, you just have a lot more flexibility. And, and so, you know, we, we didn't know, but wow, did, it was a learning experience to see that, you know, based here in Denver with a program nobody had ever heard of, that students from all over the world applied and flew to Denver to do this six-month program. I mean, it was really eye-opening. Did you see, and, and, and that's what sort of what I'm getting at, because the student, I believe, and this is just my own personal opinion, that the student has evolved significantly in the last five years. As mm -hmm. institutions have closed, students have generally gotten smarter about debt. Uh, they become more of a consumer and less 
a, a passive participant, right? You just sort of like fell into college or you're pushing. And so you, you started a business at a time period where I think that evolution of the student really started to begin. Is that something that you saw on your end where the student became just a lot smarter about what they were investing and what they were expecting? You know, given that in the early days of Galvanize, there weren't really any lending, you know, sources for mm -hmm. kind of unaccredited programs, the students had to write the checks. And so I think they were always fairly consumerized and looking at their ROI because they, they were personally going to write 100% of the checks. Now, we allowed them to pay us over time and do some innovative things. But I, I think all along, I remember in the second cohort, we had a, a really sharp guy who was a consultant at Bain & Company. And he had done a typical Bain market analysis where he mapped all of the code schools. And, and I think I did you know a couple hours of calls with him where he was really drilling into how we compared. And he ultimately went to the program and I think now works at Palantir um, and in product because he had a great business head from Bain and now he understands software. So he's a perfect intersection for that. Um, but we really had pretty solid consumer focused applicants. And I think your point is fair, whereas we've had that you know, consistently for kind of galvanized applicants. I think it's happening more and more and more in traditional hiring where people are saying, hey, fine, so I can get federally funded student loans. That's all well and good, but I do have to pay those back. You know, how, how am I going to do that? Which I think that mindset is changing. You know, my, it drives my wife crazy when I say that our boys will never go to traditional college because she just does not agree with me. I also tell her that they'll never drive, right? They're 10 years away from driving. I'm like, the boys will never drive. The boys yeah. will never drive. It's a good thing. And that drives her crazy also. So I think I may be a little more willing to accept that change is coming. Uh, and and I, I may be ahead a little bit on the timing, but I, I just don't think my boys will go to traditional college. I think to Lynn's point, I think they will want to be part of a community that will teach them kind of the non-skill side and kind of grow and be good humans and, and have a, you know, I, yeah, I'm trying to think of exactly how to describe it, but a community to be part of whilst they get skills in some other places. So I think there's there will be some amalgam, and I think you know traditional universities can play a role in that. Josh, do you, Josh and Lynn, to, to the question to both of you guys here, uh, higher ed uh, traditionally, or at least in the last just couple of years, has been very competitive against each other, right? There's a declining overall student population. Uh, universities are investing more and more money in marketing. They're extending their reach, trying to extend their brand. Is higher ed, are universities, is there a competition each other or is it now corporations that are looking to invest in education for their own employees and create different pathways outside of traditional universities? Josh, you want to go? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I can go real quick. I mean, I, it, it, it sounds like, and again, this isn't my expertise, but like, you know, it, it sounds like, yeah, there is going to be somewhat of a of an identity crisis within uh, kind of higher education and what these universities actually end up doing. Because I think, I think kids, kids are a lot smarter these days. So, you know, a good example is if you're 18 years old, right out of high school, and you wanted to become a venture capitalist, and you had some money to go do that, you could probably, I could probably myself build you a you know, three month course based on podcasts, blog posts, and case studies that I've seen. And you could probably go execute and do that and be pretty successful. So then it, then it says like, well, why do you go to college? And I think the things that Chris was saying is, is true is that the place where that'll have is either for, um, you know, kind of the experiential of like growing up and, and being part of something and, and leaving home. I don't think that's ever, I think those are and also networking is actually a very big thing. I mean, most people that I know that went to business school or got their MBA, they don't really talk about how great the MBA was. They talk about all the people that they helped them or they met during their MBA program. And that's stuff I don't think you can really, you know, do with online communities. And so I think the identity crisis becomes what are you teaching? And it maybe it comes back to these things around innovation or teaching empathy as we get into more kind of artificial intelligence and working with robots and humans or, you know, entrepreneurship to do these things where it's like, I'm going to build this baseline of really thoughtful, um, um, you know, or maybe it's philosophy or really thoughtful ways of like mental models or thinking. And then I'm going to take that and I'm going to go apply it or I'm going to get hired and then I'm going to get trained with these skills from these university or from these corporations.
fully in their talent base. So yeah, I mean, I think there probably is the, the some identity crisis. You're probably at this like evolutionary point where you, like you guys said, the smaller universities are going to have a really hard time. The bigger universities are going to start changing their narrative in terms of why you go to school there. And then it's the employees, I think, are going to add on the skill sets allow you to be successful. And I mean, that's how it's working today anyway. Just nobody wants to admit it. Most of the people that have degrees don't go and apply those degrees in the field that they go actually in from a career perspective. Lynn, what do you have to add to that? So building on that, the competition is, will be extraordinarily steep, and I think the real competition will become from the disruptive forces. I think most of them will be outside higher ed, outside higher ed with higher ed. Very few, I think, internally, except within really unique research, um, create the future kinds of um, think tanks with major global research universities that may not be as much university as they are collections of the real thought leaders and futurists, okay? Um, the idea that assimilator, that 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 um, we would take employers and they could assimilate along with a faculty member, you bring an employer, um, a, a person who is an expert in helping people learn, and you assimilate across everything out there, the perfect three-month course, I think someone would move just about, I can think of destination camps for learning, learning camps for three months or six months where you move and your intention in moving is to learn a new skill or I need to learn how to live better. And there may be a role there in traditional higher education back to some of its earliest roots, which is I need to, okay, I got my pathways for jobs now. How do I wanna live? What kind of person do I wanna be? How are we going to develop empathy? Maybe there's some wholly different kind of approach to the whole civic, affective, um, societal uh, side that I think, I think, I think we're going to get lost. It's going to get lost in here unless employers are going to pick up on that. Because I do think people are looking for a community. I would love to see an institution or something open up to offer short courses or immersive camps in different ways of living, learning, eating, working together. I mean, it could be a really fascinating venture. I think people will begin to hunger for some of that. Well, great, guys, thank you so much. I, you know, I, uh, the, the idea here was that we explore what the uh, value of higher ed here uh, is from a non-traditional perspective. And you, he you heard it here first, we're not sure. Uh, and, and it's something that's evolving. And I, and I think it's up to each institution to define what their value is, um, uh, much like any other company does for a consumer because the student is consuming. They, they decide where they want to go to school. Their choices are much greater than they used to be. The types of ways that you can go and get an education are uh, uh, more and, and more robust than they ever have been before. So it's a, it's a really hard uh, an important question that we have to answer within higher ed. And I really thank uh, Chris and, uh, and Josh uh, for bringing in that outside venture capitalist perspective, because I think it is, um, you know, it's about, uh, you know, the, the, the world is going to change. You know, Chris, when you said my, my, my boys won't drive a car, I mean, you actually think about the impact of something like that, you know, what, to higher ed, how, will they go to school? Will they go to school in the way that we offer uh, education and the answer is still there, uh, maybe no as well. So we have to figure it out real fast. And higher ed traditionally does not move fast uh, as, yeah. as an institution. Um, there are schools that do move more quickly than others. Um, and Lynn, thank you for your insider uh, a look. A lot of great ideas, guys. And I, and I thank you all. If you have uh, any of you have last words, Lynn, I'll, I'll start with you. Uh, just I think the questions are big. I think we've got to start talking about learning and learning together as a society and where we want it to take us. Jobs, yes. Careers, yes. Living, even more so. Great. Chris? Comes down to leadership and vision, just like anything else. I think yeah. for traditional higher ed institutions, there will be leaders who have a vision and get it. And those institutions are going to be very relevant for a long time. Josh? Yeah, I mean, I, I keep going back to this evolve or die type of mentality within, you know, higher education. And um, I think that's that's the way that's the way it's going. And I think you have to think about what is the 
what is the career world going to look like and build a curriculum around that to help people, you know, that's what education was there for. That's why you went to college. Um, so yeah, evolve or die and uh, here in higher education. Evolve or die folks, hashtag it. You heard it from Josh Dorsey. He was the first one to say it. <laughs> All right, guys, thank you so much. I'm gonna be signing off. I, I hope you will get a chance to download this uh, later if you didn't get a chance to view it live. Um, thank you everybody. Appreciate it. Bye. Bye-bye.